Principles have a cost, but they're always a bargain in the end. So we're on the same wavelength. Well, venture capital is investing in young companies with hugely ambitious aims in the interest of achieving a flirtation of these companies, uh, the Microsofts, uh, the Dells, the Googles. And uh, it's uh, something that started in the United States, which I became aware of when I was a student at uh, Harvard Business School, uh, because uh, there was a, a professor called General Doria who came in and announced that he had invested $70,000 in a company called DEC, and now it was going public, it was going to be worth 100 million pounds, his stake. And uh, that caught my attention. The industry didn't exist in, uh, in uh, the United States much in 1969. It just started in the States. In Europe, uh, it lagged. By about 1979, a decade later, it began to get formed, and I was privileged to be one of the pioneers of it. So what I did for business entrepreneurs, I'm now seeking to do for social entrepreneurs. Because business entrepreneurship and profit making uh, and entrepreneurial society have gone so far in creating completely new industries, uh, in creating massive wealth, that the gap between uh, the rich and, and, and the poor has got bigger than it was 25 or 30 years ago, and that's true across the whole world. And so new approaches need to begin to provide a mechanism to redress the social consequences of our system. And so I began to think of how can one do the things we've been talking about? How can one make a contribution to society that is meaningful? And how can one do it effectively? given that both government and uh, charity uh, hasn't been able to achieve it. And that's where the concept of social investment uh, began to appear in 2000, around the table of the Social Investment Task Force, which has led today to Big Society Capital, which I chair, which is a social investment bank focused on dealing with social issues. What emerged from the Social Investment Task Force is that the great power of capitalism, which is to harness entrepreneurship, innovation, capital, uh, hasn't really been applied in the social area. And yet, why shouldn't a social entrepreneur that wants to improve the dropout rate from school or the rate of homelessness, well, why shouldn't such an entrepreneur be able to access the capital markets? Uh, why should we rely on a system where philanthropy says We'll give you money for a couple of years and then come back, and, uh, but you'll probably have to go elsewhere. And where there's no real focus on achieving social performance, it made no sense to me. And so I began with my colleagues. We began to think of how you can connect a social entrepreneur to the capital market. And we developed something called a social impact bond which is now being picked up in several countries here in the United States. Australia has announced two or three issues. Israel is working on a couple of social impact bond issues. In the UK, we have a dozen. And the best example is uh, just to focus on the first one, which involved under 21-year-old prisoners. We went to the British government and we said, look, we'll raise $8 million and we will fund three or four not-for-profits working with these prisoners who today across the world reoffend at the rate of about 60% plus of them within a year of release. A massive cost to society, massive cost to our countries. And we said to the government, we'll put the money up and we'll take a risk. So you can see the venture capital thinking behind it. We'll take a risk. If we fail through these not-for-profits to reduce the rate of reoffending by 7.5% relative to the rest of Britain, Money's lost. But if these not-for-profits succeed in reducing the rate of reoffending by 75 to 15%, you'll pay the capital back, and you'll pay a rate of interest that will go annually from 2.5% to 13%. And the punchline is government pays out only one-third or a third to a half of the saving. So for the first time, a not-for-profit 
which used to raise only donations, can say, wow, if I can achieve a 10% reduction reoffending, I can pay 7.5% on my bond. I can go back to the market, I can raise 20 million pounds. I can address all of the prisons in London, or I can address all of the prisons in the country. I need to have the same vision and the same skills as a Bill Gates or a Michael Dell. I need to say, how do you deal with this issue best? And I need to get a team, and I need to be able to implement it. And this is now beginning to be understood as a potential way of revolutionizing the flow of capital into the social sector. Philanthropy then continues to play its traditional role, but it takes on additional uh, 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 meaning uh, because it can then become the layer of capital, the equity that sits at the bottom of the capital structure of a social organization that can then raise social impact bonds or, or equity or, or other securities in order to fund itself. And I think if we can manage to get governments to understand that they cannot hold the solution to dealing with social issues, and that in the same way that they didn't have the solution for growth in the economy, and they needed to create an enabling environment for innovation and entrepreneurship to thrive, if government can begin to do that in this area, I think social entrepreneurship could emulate business entrepreneurship. There is scope for changing the whole mindset of government, of financial institutions, of entrepreneurs, of executives, in the direction of addressing social issues in the same way that uh, we've addressed business ones. I'm Ronald Cohen, and you're watching Thinker.